right, well, it looks like, why don't we go ahead and get started? So let me just, first of all, you know, hopefully people will continue coming in. We understand that what we're talking about is what happens at home, the gender division of labor, and that particularly now in the pandemic, things are really crazy for, uh, for all sorts of people. So let me just first by, start by welcoming everyone that's here. Um, um, my name is Bridget Schulte. I'm the director of the Better Life Lab. And we are really excited to be hosting this happy hour. I hope that you all, this is sort of relaxed and casual. I have my, my wine <laughs> with my happy hour here. So hopefully you will all have a drink. Just, we're here to really have a conversation. Um, you know, we started this Better Life Lab Experiments project about a year ago, and we've got a number of beta testers. We're hoping that they join. But again, because we understand that times are crazy, we are also recording this. So we wanna let people know um, you know, if you'd like to turn your camera off, please feel free, um, you know, but so many people can't make it synchronously. We want to make, make it available for people who can't be here, many of them, because of the uh, division of labor at home and child care. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn it over to Emily Halgren, who is our intern, who is going to be kind of telling you about what to expect this evening. Uh, and I just really, you know, we'll dive right into the conversation, but just to, I think we, most people who are here know we're here because uh, the, the division of labor at home is really one of the final frontiers to true gender equality for, for all people across the gender, uh, gender spectrum. You know, right now it's still very much considered the primary uh, responsibility for women. And that has huge implications for their for women's being able to um, compete in the in the uh, public sector. But at the same time, because men are expected to be breadwinners, that really cuts them off from their ability to fully engage at home. And so, uh, we started this project about uh, you know uh, launched it about a year ago. We've been working on it for about two years, I would say. Before that, about a year of planning and really trying to think about how we could develop very practical tools to create more awareness, to create space for communication in a way that doesn't get into that typical nagging tit for tat fighting that goes nowhere. How can you have some honest conversations and how can we try some exposure therapy using tools from behavioral science to try to, to actually move the dial and, uh, and create new behaviors, new attitudes. Uh, and so part of what we're really hoping to do here is to get everyone's input to figure out, well, what can we do to make this um, more uh, impactful? What could we do to scale this? How can we really move the needle on gender equality at home? So with that, let me turn it over to Emily who will tell, uh, tell you all what to expect from this exciting happy hour. So cheers and welcome. Thanks Bridget. Yes, cheers. Um, hi, everybody. It's really lovely to see you all here. Thanks so much for joining us for this happy hour. Um, so we we didn't make this like a really long drawn out event, right? Like we were saying, it's pandemic times, right? We all have a lot of things to focus on, a lot of things competing for our attention. So we're looking at this as about an hour. For the first 30 minutes, we're going to have a lively discussion with our three panelists, um, just talking about their own experiences with the uh, division of household labor, what they've learned during this very unusual last seven months. Um, and if you do have questions for the panelists during that time, feel free to throw those in the chat. And then our two moderators, uh, Bridget and Haley, will make sure to take a look at those questions and incorporate them. So just feel free to put those in the chat. And then after about 30 minutes, uh, having a discussion with the panel, we're actually going to transition into some uh, breakout rooms for about 15 minutes or so. And that's just so we can really hear from people, you know, how, uh, how are things going at home, right, in this very unusual time? Um, have you tried some BLLX experiments? Just really try to get some feedback from you. As uh, Bridget was saying, we really try to see how we can really take this to the next level and really make this effective for um, uh, diverse households. So, um, and then after about 15 minutes of the breakout rooms, we'll uh, reconvene as a whole group, share some takeaways, and um, just, you know, leave with some announcements, next steps, and we'll take it from there. So um, that kind of gives you an overview. And then Haley, if you want to kick things off with the panel, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Emily. Uh, folks should know since Emily came on board with this a couple months ago, this project has just gotten new life under it. And, and it really is, as somebody who's been studying this exact topic for many years now, 
I can say I've been really frustrated by the lack of data we have out there about solutions. We are getting better and better and better about measuring the problem of, of the unequal division of labor between men and women. Um, and of course that affects some families much worse than others, certain family types, for example. But I think what where we're really lacking at the same time we're telling families get with it, do it equally, you know, we're actually lacking concrete advice for how to do that. How do you go about that? When so much of what happens in our homes on a daily basis is on autopilot. And I think especially during the, the COVID pandemic, you know, you really don't have time to plan. What you're really doing is responding, responding, responding. And BLLX from the start was, was our, our hope at trying to really test and figure out what actually works for people. And you know, we turn to the best of behavioral science, we turn to the latest research in sociology and economics, but one of the best ways we learn about what works and, and what doesn't is by actually talking to people about that. And I think uh, any number of the people here that I'm seeing on the list uh, of, of attendees would have stories to tell about what COVID has been like for them and their households. And we hope we get some of that in this discussion. But I wanna start with our panel and, and start hearing just a little bit of the different glimpses each of our panelists has gotten of this issue during the pandemic as they've been talking to other families, working with other families in different capacities as practitioners, as researchers, but also in their own households. You know, this is just one of those issues that touches every single one of us, whether we want it to or not. And so what I'd like to do is start by asking our panelists here uh, to, to tell us a little bit about what this has been like for them and what kind of knowledge they've gained during the pandemic about how you actually move toward equality in sharing the load at home. So we have fantastic panelists here. I'm gonna introduce them briefly and then I'd like to just, maybe somebody can raise their hand of the three of them and, and start us off here with what they have learned. Uh, we have Eve Rodsky, who's the fantastic author of a book, Fair Play, which uh, got a lot of headlines right before the pandemic struck because so many of us are facing this problem. How do you go about forging an egalitarian relationship? And Eve scoured uh, you know, the research of many, many, many of us here, scholars who are on this chat, scholars that we know, that we cite, and in addition to that, interviewed families and tested a system for helping them institute gender equality at home. So in terms of experience and a wealth of exposure to what different families go through, we can do no better than Eve here. And we also have uh, one of our very own, Josiah St. Julien, who's a newly a research associate at the Better Life Lab. Josiah has been uh, watching all the research come in about this throughout the entire pandemic and really thinking through what it takes them to move the needle and what it takes to try to work toward progress and equality under really dire circumstances, really not the ideal conditions that you would set for yourself if it came to when do we want to have these kinds of conversations. And so Josiah has been doing that research, but also figuring that out, not with a partner and her family in the same home, but with roommates. And we think at BLL that this tool should be something that helps no matter what your household situation is, because this is a problem anytime you have more than one person in a household that has to be solved. And I think there's really interesting insights to come from there. And then we have Steven DiFianco, who is a co-founder of a, a startup, Dad Ventures, and has become a close friend of the Better Life Lab in the past months. We actually met Steven during a Crisis Conversations episode, a podcast that we did uh, throughout the first six months of the pandemic every week to find out what was going on in people's households and workplaces. Uh, and Steven has been at the same time running a business, raising children and um, negotiating the division of labor with his wife who's also working. So uh, Steven, uh, maybe we can start here with you. Um, what has it been like for you during this pandemic to do all this, juggle all this work, and at the same time, aspire toward a more equal division of labor? Yeah, uh, great question. And thank you uh, to, to everybody for being here and, and for and, you know, having me part of this conversation. Um, it's certainly, uh, you know, we, we now say seven months, right? Did we switch? You know, it was six months, and now we're, now we're at seven months, and, and, and time just, just keeps flying by. And, and I think about how, how even just every couple months, things change. You know, in March, it was like, oh, will we be back in school before the end of the year? 
uh, will we be, oh, what school's ending? Are we, uh, what are we doing this summer? Oh no, what, what's going, oh, wait, oh, wait, school's coming back. Okay, wait, what are we doing now? And it, it just, it just is so fluid. It's, 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 it's like the last seven months feels like so many different stages. And um, I would say that sort of two big things that, that I've learned along the way, number one from the very beginning was I, I can't sit on the sidelines. Like my family cannot uh, sur like survive and thrive if I'm waiting to be told what to do. Uh, maybe that in many ways was a, a default for me in, in a, a variety of different responsibilities pre-pandemic. But when my wife is uh, focused on her career, I'm focused on my career and my kids are stuck and they're lost, like somebody has to step up, somebody has to jump in. And so we have um, adjusted to that. And I would say that putting efficiency, um, making our family, like helping, basically saying now is normal and saying, this is, this is the normal, this is just what it is. And we just have to adjust to these times and how can we survive and thrive in these times uh, is how we've approached it. Now, I would just say the last thing is the downside is that on one hand, we've become a really efficient machine. Like we, we have our systems, we're like getting things done. I understand what I need to do. She understands what new, she needs to do. But what kind of gets lost in all the efficiency is just the humanness, is the like, oh my God, I'm burning out. Oh my God, like I need some time. I need some help. I need to see my friends. Um, how are you? How are you taking care of yourself? And, um, and I think that's just been uh, the, the balance is like, okay, we have to jump in. We have to, it's an emergency. We have to change. But in that, it's just like, whoa, hang on. Like, it's, if, if, uh, if we don't take care of ourselves and each other, then we're in even worse, worse trouble. Thanks so much for starting us off with that, Stephen. Um, Eve, how does, how does Steve's story compare with what you've been hearing from families and what you've been seeing as you continue this work? Well, a few things. I think um, the secret formula it, that I've seen, uh, same thing, culling through all of our data and our research, and now even with Daniel Carson, and, uh, he has a new paper coming out that he calls task sharing, which I think is a dangerous word. I call that redealing of the cards, but same, same work. Um, this idea that systems are part of it, right? And fair play is a system, an ownership mindset. And thank God for Carol Dweck. For, and when I used to talk about mindsets, people had no idea what I was talking about, but now our kids are inundated with the power of yet. And so the idea of an ownership mindset, but I think the other two pieces that we miss sometimes are the boundaries and the communication. So I think it's the trifecta of boundary systems and communication. Being efficient and knowing what you're doing it every time and customizing those defaults is really, really important. But the idea that part of it means also the boundaries to be yourself and to say that the intensive togetherness, this intensive parenting, this sort of Pinterest culture, the idea that so many people suddenly they feel guilty if they don't accompany their partner on a trip to fucking Costco. I'm like, just let your partner go get the damn diaper so you can go take a run, right? It's this idea that we always have to be together all the time. So how do you set those boundaries? And on top of it, the communication. So one thing I asked was, especially of men, why do you communicate? I was looking for somebody to give me the answer that they communicate to communicate. But actually in all the men I interviewed, and there's hundreds now, everybody, mostly everybody gave me the answer that they communicate as a means to an end. Well, yeah, I communicate because I have to get the sponge out of the thing. I communicate to tell my wife that she has to log our kids onto Zoom. So I challenge people to think of communication as a practice. And we're investing in um, toilet paper more than we're investing in our relationships. And so when I challenge couples to add a 10 minute and I check in, where you can set a timer if you're long-winded, but this idea of checking in, I would say that, that those are the rounding out pieces of the system. The idea of the permission to be unavailable um, from your roles. And then that idea of how do you check in with your partner to humanize your daily experience, even if it's just for 10 minutes. And that's sort of the trifecta that I see really working very well right now. The boundaries plus the systems plus communication. Jitsaya, when you hear that, the boundaries, the communication, 
is that coming up in households like yours where this is not about maybe the baggage and the guilt of being there all the time for your partner or your kids, but you're sharing a space, you're all working and living in that space. What, what has this been like in, in your household? Yes, um, so definitely the importance of communication has been front and center, I think, since the outset of the pandemic. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one, first of all, we are, at this point, we are five adult women living together. So there are no children in the house. So there's no one to really tell us what to do. We have to communicate to one another our needs and our expectations. And so starting out, um, it was quite clear that each of us at the time had different expectations around you know, what our household should look like during the pandemic, who should be doing what. We had different assumptions about who would be doing what. And part of that was because prior to the pandemic, we'd all somewhat been operating on this autopilot um, kind of mentality where we would allow, honestly, someone who is used to, let's say, unloading the dishwasher or is used to taking out the trash to continue doing that. And it was very easy to just kind of walk past that because, you know, I'm out, my, I'm out the door, I'm on the way to catch the bus. Uh, thank you, you know, or like, oh, I have a call, but, you know, thanks for like unloading the dishwasher. Um, and so we basically got stuck in our routines. But during the pandemic, it was very clear that we're at home 24 seven, we can't ignore the fact that the trash is piling up and no one wants to take it out or that the dishes are piling up because now it's four people eating, you know, three meals a day within the house. Um, and so it became important for us to talk about, okay, it's not fair for one or two people to always do the same routine task. What do you want to do? How should we go about breaking these tasks up? Um, and so now we actually have this cute little um, chart on the side of our fridge where we have five tasks that need to happen in the house every week. And then we have our names as tags and then we just rotate those names, you know, over and over again. Um, however, that took us a while to get to that point. This is the second iteration of like, what should we, you know, do as a household when it comes to like managing chores. Um, and so we actually have a house meeting this evening after this call um, to talk about, you know, how are things going in terms of cleaning, in terms of you know boundaries and what we need for workspaces, and also what does it look like to live healthily and safely as a household? Um, because our ideas of you know we're in this particular stage of the pandemic um, where we can maybe go out more, it's starting to look even more complicated. Um, and so the need for communication is definitely something that has been coming up time and again, but has also been just very helpful in allowing us to feel comfortable sharing our needs. Um, and talking about what we feel is fair or unfair and how to change that. Thank you so much. Uh, those were all fantastic. I've been busily taking notes as well. Uh, and I love that, you know, everything that, that everyone said, that, that notion of what is fair. I kind of want to start there because what's really clear when you look at the, at the research from before the pandemic and certainly now, you know, when you look at who's stepping back and reducing work hours, who's leaving the workforce, who's, you know, who, who are losing their jobs. When you look at the most recent unemployment figures, it's women. And when, you know, you dig down about why that is, a lot of it is care and caregiving and, you know, feeling that they're doing more homeschooling or spending more hours on childcare as schools and childcare places are still closed. You know, so Eve, let me go back to you and, and start with this question, like, how do you create the space to talk about this? The, you know, how do you create the, you know, even the, you know, set the table, if you will, with, you know, the three great, you know, communications and boundaries and systems that you're talking about when families are just, um, you know, so many of them are just hanging on by their fingernails, you know, how do you, I'd like to ask all three of you that, how, how do you create space in this time when it doesn't feel like there's much space to take on something that kind of can feel like a big project like this? Well, I think um, the way I look at it, it I'm an ec economist by trade. Um, so I look at, it's really the value of time and Bridget, you're, you speak so beautifully about time. So I think um, it's sort of the way women look at their economic equations where they say to me often that they left the workforce because their salary just covered childcare. Right, so we're making very, um, you know, I'd like to talk about like, yes, we're, we, we get into co cultural conversations about the life-changing magic of organizing our junk drawer, right? But really the life-changing magic is the long-term thinking, recognizing that you may not always be partnered, recognizing that the motherhood penalty will hit you, um, recognizing that 43% of women with children opt out of the workforce. 
So I think if we look at it as sort of like paper boy, I'm, I'm dating myself, but like, you know, some sort of game where you sort of see the future obstacles and sometimes it's easier to plan in the present for what they are. So really I'm speaking for uh, the younger women behind us um, and men to say that you wanna get it right now. And so if you wanna say in the time it takes me to tell him or her or they what to do, I might as well do it myself right now because I'm in a crunch, right? So what was happening even pre-pandemic was so many women told me that they were opting out of the workforce because they were what I call new super women. So, this is a fair play visualization of the deck, right? Of the unpaid labor, that they were holding all these cards. And so then one more thing came, their mother went into chemo. One more thing came, they had a bad manager. One more thing came, um, their child got diabetes, all true stories, and they were out, out of the workforce. Once you're out of the workforce one year, um, you lose those half a million dollars of wages and savings over your lifetime. And so I think this idea that we don't look holistically at our decisions. And so, yes, of course, these are systemic issues, but there are also things that we can think about and do in advance in our own household. And that's what I love about Better Life Lab so much and what you are doing, Bridget and Haley, my favorite people on your team, because you're the best people at combining the systematic, systemic inequity with actual uh, recognizing that you can take agency in your own home. And so that's what I will say, the life-changing magic of long-term thinking. And last thing I will say is that I spoke to a woman who calls herself the mama attorney. And she told me she's spoken to over 2000 women now in the pandemic. And most of them were saying, I'd rather drop out than have my husband take leave that they're due under the new CARES Act. And they were not willing to ask their partner to take that type of sacrifice um, and they said it was easier for them just to drop out. You know, to that point, you know, that's one thing that the research shows over and over again, that in, in many partnered relationships, men tend to be older. So they're that much further ahead in their careers. You know, and then we have the, the gendered wage gap that, you know, you look at where men, no matter what, uh, you know, no matter what the profession is, there's a, there's a wage gap. And even if you've got the same education and experience, there's a wage gap. And then there's the, the sectoral wage gap that we tend to value the work that men do much more than the work that women tend to do in like health and in care and in education. You know, so you've got all of those, um, you know, reasons, I guess, for families to sort of automatically favor men continuing to work. You know, so Stephen, let me ask you, you know, how do you uh, you know, how can you, I mean, that's a huge systemic issue. How, how can families kind of work against that or uh, be aware of that or, or still work on gender equity at home when the, the deck is sort of stacked against you systemically at work? I was, I was certain you were going to ask Eve about this. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm, I will share, I'm happy to share my perspective and, and, you know, I, I, bow down to Eve and all the research and, you know, that she's done and, and, and how she can back that up. Where I can, you know, speak from is, is the research that I've done talking to parents as well as cer certainly my personal experience. Um, and I would say this, that my, um, I have three children. I have two, two, two girls, um, 10, eight, and then a, a four-year-old boy. And there's so much um, that motivates my wife and I uh, that is in regards to setting the right example for our children. And so Eve was, was just talking about like, hey, for, for, you know, for, for future generations as well, this is highly impactful. And I like how Eve refers to this as this is inevitable, right? Like, but what can we do to speed up this change? And so, so for me, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, valuing my wife's time. So my daughter had a, uh, a orthodontist emergency or orthodontist appointment last week. Um, uh, my wife was, wasn't sure. Was it Wednesday? Was it, was it Thursday? Uh, it's like, okay, sure. Let me, let me step in. She's given me <laughs> an opportunity. She is certainly doing a lot of this work. Um, but there's an opportunity for me to be a leader, to step in and, and do my part. Uh, so I, uh, was able to figure out, okay, it was Thursday. Uh, and I said, I texted her, 
um, even though she was probably upstairs. Um, it's Thursday, I can take her. Now, I had, a, I had a conflicting meeting, but I could take that call on the road. That wasn't a big problem. She probably could have taken um, our daughter as well. But for me, it's like the more that I can signal to her that, that her time is valuable, that I am going to do my part, uh, the more that she can, I think, absorb that message. It's, it's, it's not an easy one for her. <laughs> to just let go and say, okay, yeah, like, cause the default for her is she will do it. Um, so like, that's sort of how I think about it is like setting that example and then, you know, having these conversations and, 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 and understanding like, okay, I recognize that your time is valuable, that like, uh, that, that, that we have to support each other and it's not just you supporting me, but it's supporting each other. I, I love that. And, you know, Eve, you describe it so beautifully that women tend to think of their time as like sand, you know, or we tend to think that the, you know, it's infinite and that we think of men's time as diamonds. I think that that's just a, such a brilliant thing that you said, you know, do you have thoughts and Jitsai, do you want to, uh, anything to add in, uh, you know, at, at this really critical moment, how to try to create space for, for this and then let me turn it over, you know, we'll let each of you give a, a quick response and then I'll turn it over to Haley. We've got a question from the chat. Yeah, I think something that really came up uh, in terms of what Steve and both Eve uh, mentioned were this idea of agency and the importance of um, number one, being active in taking you know, responsibility and taking up tasks, but also thinking about you know, what um, patterns, what behaviors, um, what trends are we setting for the future? And so when I think about that in the context of our household of five women aging from you know, 25 to 35 years old, we're all single women at the time. Um, I'm wondering, you know, when we are thinking about work in our home, you know, what are the expectations that we're setting and what are the patterns that we're setting for ourselves moving forward? You know, in what ways can we disrupt um, the, the, I think the default of someone taking care of one thing, two things and allowing that to be the norm. Um, and so I'm hoping that by thinking about ways to equally share the household within our home, um, we are going to set ourselves up with expectations when we do enter into, you know, relationships. Of when I lived with my roommates, I never, you know, took care of everything. That was never the norm. So I'm not going to expect that, you know, when I enter into this new relationship, you know, this long-term relationship with someone else. And so I think that even when we are in these situations, it may not be like a traditional household setting we should train ourselves to think about, you know, household work in a way that is equitable, so that when we enter into new stages, we are carrying that framework and mindset with us. So that's kind of like that idea of agency and making that a habit that's coming up for me. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what, what Jitsaya just said there resonates so much with me. I mean, I have to say, uh, you know, I, I just recently married uh, my, my, my love who uh, I actually met at the Better Life Lab. So, um, you know, many common interests, mutual interest in equality. The interesting thing is that uh, I'm married to a woman and the rest of my life I had only lived with male partners. And I can, I, I've sort of suddenly had this weird thing happen to me where I'm the one who's not carrying the mental load or I'm the one who doesn't get to the dishes fast enough. And I never had that experience when I was with men. I, I was always sort of simmering, like, fine, I guess I'll do it because I see it and it's not worth the conversation. And now that's totally flipped where I started to notice, you know, in the first year we lived together, like, you know, I think she wants me to wash that dish but I really don't want to right now. Like it doesn't need to be washed right now. And it totally flipped the script. And it was this, it's the same we're work. I mean, we work through it every day. Like any couple, of course, you have to work through your expectations, my expectations. But the liberating thing about it is exactly what Jedi, I think was talking about, like that it puts us back almost in a role where we don't have those gendered scripts. And we get to just talk about what do we want our household to feel like? What do we, how clean do, does it need to be? What are the kinds of like rules we can put in place to mostly keep it fair? And then from there we work it all out. And I think that that's kind of been liberating, which is one of the reasons I was so excited about having Jadzaya talk about the roommate situation. Like if we brought roommate fairness to bear on our 
our romantic partnerships, our families, what, what would that change, especially in the way women approach those conversations? Um, so that's kind of my lesson from COVID and the, the, the strange, stressful times that it's brought about is if there's a way you can approach those conversations without that baggage in some way, put yourself in roommate mode, whatever it is, you know, and you're not mad at the whole, you know, population of men or whoever else, when you come into those, it really changes the dynamic. Um, and I'm grateful to my partner for doing that, not projecting my own habits, you know, as sort of like, this is what everybody has ever done to me before. It can just be on, on that terrain of our household. Um, so I'm curious as we close out here, I, this, this time just flew past, but I'd love to hear from all three of our panelists before we close out. And I think this is really about um, Annabella's question, which she's getting at too. How do you disrupt these scripts? How do you move beyond it? If there's one piece of advice you can give to families or households, however people are sharing the load for how to do this in a pandemic, what would that takeaway be? What would that one insight be that you're hoping could um, create some change and disrupt some of these patterns that, that just sort of take over? Uh, somebody, is anybody like willing to go first? Steve, Josiah, Eve? I think you're all worthy. Eve, all right, I see you Sorry. unmuting yourself. Um, I think this all comes down to time. Um, again, it's, it's, it's um, you know, the economist in me, um, when you devalue your own time, you're not gonna disrupt any patterns or use your voice or, or lose your guilt and shame. And so when you say things to yourself, like I do more because my partner makes more money than me, or when you say I do more because I'm a better multitasker and that's my superpower, if you say I do more because in the time it takes me to tell him, her, they what to do, I should just do it myself. Those are all highly toxic messages that are devaluing your own time. And what they do is they, they devalue all of your future time. And that also leads to society devaluing our time. So I think for me that my dream, I always say is like an hour holding your child's hand in the pediatrician's office is just as valuable as an hour in the boardroom. And it was white professional class men that could not say they believed that an hour holding your child's hand in the pediatrician's office, or as Steve said at the orthodontist um, office, is as valuable as an hour in the boardroom. Once we get society to believe that those are equal hours, then white men will do this. And we need those, we need those men who are still, unfortunately, the leaders in this country to value care. And so that's, that's my dream, that the more we work together as cultural warriors um, to disrupt the fact that we devalue women's time and we don't believe housework and childcare is valuable, um, the more we disrupt that together, the more collective power we have to make real change in the future. Thanks so much for that. Josiah, you ready? You have a takeaway, yeah. a nugget of, of advice for us? Yes, I do. Um, so my nugget of advice is going to sound very familiar, um, but it's basically, if you see something, say something. That's what they, like the thing they have like in the airport or something. But they, yes, if you see something, say something. Um, and when I say, if you see something, I mean, if you see something that your roommate or your partner is struggling with or is always doing and you notice it, you should say something. That's what I mean by that. Um, and hopefully that will open up a conversation where they feel like they're seen and valued without having to complain about something. And then that can open the door for having these conversations um, about, you know, what does it look like to maybe change this or to do this more fairly? Um, that would be my nugget. I love that. I That's like uh, exact, exactly what my wife and I have come to is that when you see the unfair pattern, it's on you to say something because I've been in the uh, on the other side of this, right? When it was on me to try to figure out how to initiate that conversation, and and I I so now know how liberating it is to have the other person. You know, when when you're already carrying the mental load, you don't also have to want to be responsible for that conversation. So I really love that advice. And Steve, how about you? Yeah, uh, totally agree with 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 um, with both recommendations and, and just to build off of the see something, say something. I've learned, I've learned the hard way that there are many bad times to talk to my wife like during the day. 
when she is like has like two minutes between like phone calls and she's just getting some food and like you know she's got to go you know she's in the middle of some like deep concentration work right and so uh to me it's like oh it's on top of my mind i should tell her this because otherwise i'll forget it and then like that just leads to disaster so like see something say something at the appropriate time uh, uh and maybe that's scheduling it Maybe it's like, hey, I'm texting you. Hey, can we talk later tonight? Uh, this needs, you know, there's this going on. And so like that has been a huge because I've, I've stepped in that landmine too many times. I don't want to do that anymore. And I, I urge uh, everyone to, uh, to just keep that in mind. That's great. All right. Well, like, thank you so much for this, you know, for this really uh, fascinating and important panel. And I feel like we could go on for hours. But I, again, in the interest of time, I think what we're going to do now is uh, move to breakout rooms where we've got, um, let me turn it over to Emily, who can tell us a little bit more about the experiment that she's uh, developing. And we're really hoping to get some feedback on this, as well as some of the other experiments we're running in this in this project and how we can really um, you know, work with, you know, Eve's project of fair play is so excellent. And how can we work to amplify and support that work to really help people at home? So Emily, what can people expect now? Yeah, thank you so much. That was such an, a really wonderful discussion. I think a lot of really productive advice came out of that. So thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so now we're going to shift into some breakout rooms for about 15 minutes or so. Um, there'll be uh, four of us who will be facilitating those. So you'll either be in a breakout room with myself, uh, Josiah, Bridget, or Haley, uh, one of us four. And no, I'm sorry, Shade. <laughs> so sorry. Actually, it'll be myself, Shade, Bridget, or Haley. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, yeah, we just have some questions, just trying to get a better sense of like, um, you know, what motivates people to uh, sort of take part in this beta tester community, get your feedback. And then we also have a um, sort of a new tool that we're uh, developing, um, an idea that we have for a future Better Life Lab experiment. And so um, we were going to uh, have everybody take a look at that. Did we actually get a chance to put that in the chat, the link to that? Okay, great. So, um, Actually, I um, can new can the events team help us uh, transition over to break rooms to breakout rooms. Definitely, you all have been randomly assigned to the four rooms, and you will have fifteen minutes with some notifications of countdown. And here you go. Hello, it looks like we're the only ones back. <laughs> I guess we had to, you know, we had to choose to leave, and that was, you know, Melissa, you're right in the middle of such a great. Oh no. You know, I don't know how great it is, but I, um, it might take some pressures off. Um, it, it's so complicated, right? I think it's so complicated and you're, you know, people are in a really tough place, um, because of the pandemic, but also like life stage, um, with little kids and two jobs. Um, it's, it's a really tough spot to just recognize it could be a hump to get over and things could get better, you know? Yeah, that's such a good point. And Janet, one of the things that, you know, we do have a, a beta test that's a, you know, that we call it ninja level, where you like write out all the test tasks, and then you decide who does it. But one of the things that I, you know, when my husband and I were trying to like, figure out how to rebalance things when they gotten so bad, is we just had a, a session where we just sat down and talked to each, you know, kind of like had, you know, even with the kids and just sort of like wrote it down, brainstormed together, what's the bucket of work? That, need, mm -hmm. that we need to do to run this house. And then mm -hmm. when you write it all out and you do it together and then you see it, then it's almost like then you can begin having conversations about, well, who should do what? Or are there certain things that you can cross off the list altogether? You know, that maybe that that's, a, that's one thing that really, that really helps sort of a practical solution for um, my husband and I <laughs> when I was in my rage phase. Right, right. So um, it, yeah, does it, I was just going to say, are we all back now? Or are we still waiting for other breakouts? I think everyone is now back. Okay. But it sounds like we caught you all in a very interesting conversation. And the breakout rooms also cut off Heather while she was making a great point about uh, where we were. So um, I think we have many, many uh, fantastic, not only uh, participants who are experiencing this, but also who have a lot of expertise who are present. So it's just really fantastic breakout, Bridget. 
That's great. Ours was as well. So why don't we do a quick lightning round? I know that we're getting really down on time, but um, we really wanted to have one person from each group to just kind of report out what the main um, thoughts were on challenges as well as solutions. And so Janet um, in our group had, um, you know, was just express, experience what a lot of caregivers and particularly women are experiencing um, and, and sort of talking about some of the challenges that we're trying to resolve, to address with BLLX. And so we were talking about some potential kind of, you know, experiments that might help. So Janet, let me turn it over to you. I, um, so I have uh, some young children um, and there's definitely imbalance in the caregiving aspects um, among other things. Um, and because of that imbalance, I'm, I mean, I am, staring right at losing my job. I've already had my hours cut back. So I'm at least gonna end up being part-time and lose my benefits. It is just a terrible situation. Um, so that's that's tough to deal with. Um, and then um, I've, we've noticed that under stress, we just fall back on our old, old ingrained patterns that we didn't even know were ingrained um, that we kind of picked up from our families when we were growing up. Um, and my husband and I have very different patterns that we're falling back on. Um, and then we also struggle with how do we even create the space to have the discussions that we need to have. Um, by the time we get all the kids in bed, like I'm probably already asleep. He's probably already asleep. I'm, you know, we don't even want to talk to each other. We just want to like go to sleep. <laughs> So how do we how do we make that conversation happen um, in a in a in a peaceful place? Um, so that's a struggle for us. Yeah, thank you so much, Janet. And so we were sort of brainstorming solutions, and I was just really briefly one of the BLLX experiments. Uh, Melissa Milky had a great suggestion of like you know taking what Jedziah was saying, like, you know, the list on the refrigerator. So it's kind of written and it's clear and you're not nagging and it's not still kind of like ambivalent. And so even though we have a sort of a ninja level experiment that we actually, um, uh, we attribute to the Gottman uh, folks who do a lot of really great um, work with um, partners and marriages and couples and families. Um, but th that what I did in my family when we were in a very unbalanced and I was very resentful and rageful all the time we worked together, I sat down with my family and around the table when I'd said, I just had had it. And we said, let's, let's put the bucket of work that it takes to run this house together. And then once it was on paper and we all created it together, you know, and then we could just see how much there was. And then we could see and like, who does it? Mom, 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 mom. Got, it's got ridiculous. And then it became clear how ridiculous it was. And it was the beginning of conversations about how to change that. So that was one of the things we were talking about with Janet. So let me turn it over to the next group. Am, am I the next group? On my screen, I'm, I'm like right next to Bridget, but I don't know if that's how other people's screens look. <laughs> Go for it, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, our, our conversation um, follows along those same, li same lines, particularly how um, oftentimes the roles that you end up inhabiting aren't necessarily the roles you saw for yourself. It's just a habit. It's what you saw growing up. Um, and because it feels so natural, because you've been doing it, you know, for however long, it's really hard to stop doing it and to like set new patterns. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to share because I, I myself am young and childless. <laughs> so this isn't really me speaking from my experience. Um, so if anyone else in, in my small group wants to share, um, we, can, we can go ahead and do that. I'll just jump in briefly with what our group discussed because it builds really off of the themes here. But along these lines of, you know, the roles we play and the scripts we follow, we, I really put it kind of straight to folks in our group about one of the tensions of BLLX, which is, that the people who are drawn to the experiments are the people who are already overburdened with the work. And so it just, you know, can become one more thing. And so how do we get more men involved? And, you know, you can see the participants, even when we have a dad on here to talk about his experience, it's mostly women who come and attend. Um, and so we really talked about that directly. And one of the really great insights from Kate and Heather was, write some experiments around what men feel they disproportionately carry 
And it might not, not that there, we know from statistics, right, where things are falling, but that might be an inroad for men to see themselves in this and be able to gain some empathy over what it must feel like to be on the other side. So maybe enter into some of those arenas with the experiments and try to degender them from the other side, you know, whether it's managing finances or, um, or yard work or household repairs, you know, these kinds of things that we see in those surveys again and again that men do more of and maybe think about it um, in those terms. And then I also put the, just at the very end, we have like one minute left, I put the, the thermometers um, up on the screen and Kate was saying um, from Kate's research that people need that zero time. Like people really need that time when they're not responsible at all. And so that, at, we, we didn't get to have the full conversation but I feel like that at least was a good, uh, an indication that maybe this kind of experiment, getting people to just think, even in the craziest of times, are they ever at zero, that that could be a good springboard for some conversations on fairness. Yeah, do we, uh, will we, do we have another minute or two? So yeah, I'll just jump off of that. So we did take a look at the tool, uh, the potential responsibility meters in my group as well. And I think we were just saying that, you know, uh, you know, anything that's like, can be like an op like open up a conversation, right, is all is definitely um, good. Um, and just try to get like what's in my head and what's in my partner's head or my roommate's head right out in the open. Um, we also talked about this idea of like, if we have to get, we really need to get people's buy-in. Um, Steven mentioned this idea of like, how can we sort of like align our goals with like people's self-interest and Steven, feel free to jump in, but just this idea of like, okay, I really need self-care. Like I'm really feeling burnt out. Right. So like, let's have a conversation with that because I care about your self-care and you care about mine. Right. But like, this is my need right now. Right. And so like, we can find ways to like align the goals with like people's self-interest in a way. Right. Um, understanding that like people in households also care about each other right um so yeah just thinking about like tools that can help open up conversations that are based in um you know respect and healthy dialogue um is definitely you know something households really need so uh that's kind of all i'll say unless anybody wants to jump in yeah just just uh when when emily uses the word people i use the word men how do you align how do you align men's self-interest yeah. with with a, with a test because, and it was, it was my self-interest in, in taking care of myself that I said, hey, uh, Anne, what is your, my, to my wife, what is your self-care list look like? And then we were able to have that conversation, but it really, it, for me, to be honest, it started with my self-interest. I need self-care. So like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if she had come to me, like uh, with, you know, with this thermometer and, you know, I might just put up like defense, like right away, like, oh, what is this? Like, what, you know, but if she's like, oh, how are you? I see you're struggling over here. Like, I understand. I'm very empathetic to you. And then like that way in, and like you're saying, whether it's where dad already is, meeting dad where already he already is, or, or man, you know, partner, wherever he is. Uh, I think that's a great approach. That's fantastic. Anyone else? I think the I think that we got all four breakout groups. So thank you all for participating in the breakout groups and sharing those great thoughts. Um, uh, you know, let me turn it over to Emily for some of our you know a real quick wrap up of next steps, and then I'll I'll come back on for a final <laughs> final goodbye, <laughs> and then we'll let you go. Yeah. Thanks, Bridget. Yeah. Thanks everyone so much for participating. In this I think this was a really excellent way to kind of like. Uh, kind of relaunch uh, Better Life Lab experiments for this uh, new time that we're living in. So just real quick, um, I'm really just going to share some resources for sort of staying in touch and building community around, um, you know, BLLX and beta testing, the beta tester community. So I'm going to pop the link to our Facebook group here in the chat, also uh, to our Instagram. Please feel free to follow those, uh, to post. Um, we would definitely, you know, love to see that, you uh, type of engagement. Um, and then uh, we will also be sending the newsletter bi-weekly, you know, in the in the coming months. So we'll we're gonna try to really uh, share like resources and support um, in addition to uh, coming experiments. And you know, we just we know that like when people are trying to make behavioral change, right? Or try to make it a change stick, that social support is really, really important. So um, if you have other ideas about Good ways to help you stay connected or how to build community, you know, feel free to get in touch with us. So I'll just put our email in there. Um, you may have other ideas or suggestions about ways that we could actually like form, right, um, a community that feels more connected and more ongoing. 
Um, so yeah, feel free to share those with us. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Yeah, so thank you so much, Emily. Thank you to everyone, as, she, as Emily said, as we all have said, we really want this to be a community. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Let us know what you're struggling with. Let us know what we, you know, help us figure out how to best help you. We really look for your feedback. We, we're excited to hear back from our beta testers. Um, you know, if you, you know, go to the Facebook page, if there's, if you tried something and you, you know, another tweak would work, you know, share that, take a picture of what you, you know, what you're trying and put it on Instagram. Let's try to build community and kind of movement around this. Um, the other thing for the, uh, the researchers on, uh, you know, who are, who are on the call today, uh, we've got some other researchers who are actually really interested in designing experiments themselves and then working with our beta testers to help them with their own research. So beta testers, you could be part of, a, again, a much, uh, you know, movement for much bigger change. So uh, researchers think about, you know, is there an experiment you could think of that you would want to run, that you would want to um, work with our beta testers uh, for, um, you know, we'd, we're really excited about continuing to grow this and make this a really valuable resource so that we really can bring much more ease and equity to families and, you know, all, all across the country and uh, uh, potentially, potentially beyond. So thank you all for joining us tonight um, and uh, onward. Uh, the, the, the movement toward gender equity continues. <laughs>